Hello, I'm Gustavo Tolosa, and I am in Dallas, Texas. I am the webinar host for Dr. McDougall and his guests every week. And today we have a very special guest that we have been uh, working on getting online here, and that is Dr. Doug Lyle. And uh, Dr. Doug Lyle is the psychologist for the McDougall program, and he also works at True North Health Center, and uh, it's always a privilege to interview him and to have him as a guest, and uh, you all know his book, The Pleasure Trap, and um, I just wanted to say a few words today about the trip to Hawaii last week, and um, it was amazing. You can see a little bit of my <laughs> my uh, redness in my face. It was great food, great company. I highly recommend that you um, try it next time. I don't know when the next time is going to be. I met a lot of lovely people, and uh, it's just a great way to get connected and to get support in order to be successful. I also want to mention that tomorrow is the beginning of uh, the weekend, of the advanced study weekend. And um, as I'm waiting for everybody to uh, log in, I will show you the screen uh, so that you all can see. I think there's still time for you to register, And you can see the website here. This is the... Um, this is the next 10-day uh, program, and you can go to drmcdougall.com and sign up for it. It's on March 3rd, as you can see here, and then there's um, three more after that. And the Advanced Study Weekend is right here, and I think that I don't think it's sold. It may be sold out, but maybe there is still some room. Um, it's a very... Uh, great uh, conference to attend, amazing guests, so I definitely recommend that. And um, I would like to welcome Dr. Lyle, now you are on screen. How are you doing today from California? Very good, good to see you, Gustavo. Nice to see you, and I know I'm gonna see you this weekend. And I'm excited as usual, and I'm going to see you the following weekend also, because that's the test, uh, is that the healthy taste of Sacramento, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, and you will be there, and Dr. McDougall will be there. If anybody lives in the Sacramento area or in Sacramento, I highly recommend that, that you attend. It's going to be Dr. McDougall, Mary McDougall, his uh, son, Craig McDougall, then you're going to be there, Chef AJ, two other chefs, and I think there are a, a few other doctors. I'll try to show you, everybody, the, the website later on as we finish. So, uh, Dr. Lyle, I have some questions that people have submitted. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, if you don't mind, uh, would you tell me what, 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 what is one of the most common questions that you get from people, um, whether it is in a group setting when you do the 10-day program or in private sessions, when they're trying to, uh, you know, get used to the uh, plant-based way, way of eating. I mean, do you do you see a pattern of, of something that most people ask or struggle with during that transition? Yeah, I think the 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 most common mistake uh, that I see where people are lost is uh, a lot of people that get into this arena have a, a notion that healthy eating means salad and steamed vegetables and fruit, and they're sort of not sure what else. And as a result, uh, a lot of them will think that they're being a good kid uh, by having a big salad at lunch, for example. And they don't understand that the center of a healthy diet is starches. And uh, I like to add something to this that sometimes helps people see something more clearly. And that is that the starches need to be wet uh, the starch, uh, dry starch is like bread. And so that greatly increases the calorie density because we pull the water out of the food. Uh, the starches should be wet. So oatmeal is wet and uh, corn on the cob is wet and, and a baked potato is wet and rice is wet. Um, even pasta, uh, which is more concentrated than a, a purely natural starch, 
is wet and therefore it's only half the calorie density of bread, which is essentially the same chemical. Uh, and so this is the biggest mistake that people are making is that they don't understand that starch is the center of what it is that you're going to be eating that's going to be healthy. And the fruits and vegetables are actually at the periphery. And uh, so if you don't know what your starch is that you're eating for lunch, you're in trouble. Oh, uh, I also, you know, rice, potatoes, beans, corn, oats, uh, pasta, etc. These are the big starches. And if you do, if your day isn't centered around those, then what happens is that people get hungry uh, through great self-discipline. They're picking around with some fruit and salad and maybe some steamed vegetables. And uh, they are thinking they are not sure what to think. And at that point, uh, a lot of times they'll they'll start diving into some very rich foods. Now, this is where the peanut butter and crackers or bread comes out uh, because people are hungry and they're craving greater calorie density and the calorie density that they're craving would be satisfied by by the major starches. Right, right. right. And it's such a good, like as people say, it's such a good pointer because we forget that the starches are what keep us satisfied. Sure. Very good. So here we have a, a question by one of our viewers, and this person says, um, let's see here. There is a popular theory being uh, that one should not exercise at the same time that they're attempting to lose weight because uh, of the willpower. Uh, that maybe gets washed out or something and makes it harder to follow the diet. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I understand what they're what they're trying to say, and what they're trying to say is this, and that is that the the concepts modern thinking about willpower is that you only have so much ability to change so many things in your life, and that if you add exercise uh, to the pile then you're going to not be as do as good a job on your uh, diet. It turns out this is not likely to be the case. That exercise is actually the one thing that you can add into your life that actually generally improves your willpower across the board. And uh, we're not sure why this is. There's some speculation as to why that might be true. But uh, definitely that that is incorrect, at least at this point in the game. Uh, there's no no uh, empirical support for the idea that that adding exercise is going to reduce your willpower in general, actually quite the opposite. So it's a good idea to, uh, if you're trying to lose weight, incidentally, you don't exercise calories off. That's not the point. The point is, is that you will feel better. Uh, there's a possibility that by exercising, you get better at kicking glycogen uh, out of your liver, uh, essentially, because you put demands on the system as you uh, as you go through the exercise process. And so as a result of that, um, it, it could be that the, that the increased ability at mobilizing glycogen may actually improve willpower generally so that when you, need, when you actually need support, uh, when you're kind of burned out and tired, you are, you are able to mobilize uh, glycogen more effectively and therefore support your blood sugar levels in the brain. So this is, this is speculative, it's interesting. Um, we're not sure about what the truth is, but one thing is for sure. And that is that adding a moderate exercise program into your life is not going to reduce your willpower uh, in general. It's going to support it. Can you say a few words about what is glycogen? Glycogen. This is basically the sugar that is stored in your liver. Uh, when you eat, uh, there's, you know, so if you eat a baked potato, you don't burn up that, the calories of that baked potato right away. What will happen is, is that uh, some of that uh, glycogen or sugar uh, will be stored in your liver and also in your muscles. So uh, this is this is generally kind of like a gas tank that uh, that your body lives on, and this is what happens uh, when when you go without food for about a day, or you go on an all protein Atkins style diet. You will lose that glycogen. You'll burn through that glycogen in about a day, and then you'll go into ketosis, uh, which is where you start burning fats. So this is, um, gl glycogen is, is what it is that your life is designed to run on basically. 
Right, right. Okay, very good. Yeah, and Dr. McDougall talked a lot about uh, ketosis and the last couple of times, and I really encourage people to watch those two webinars. So in, with going on with the same topic, topic of exercise, here's another question. Uh, I want to exercise more, but my motivational triad seems to point me in the direction of the sofa. It feels good to rest. There's no sweat involved and my energy is conserved. How do you get around this way of thinking to enjoy the wonderful health benefits of an active life, lifestyle? Well, um, I can say that that uh, I actually went through this to, to, to be a little bit revealing. I went through this with Chef AJ a few years back. So Chef AJ and I had uh, very good discussions about diet and health and weight loss and everything else. And uh, I was explaining to her that exercise is a, a very useful and important component, not, not to burn calories and weight loss, that's not the point, but to actually just feel better generally. Uh, it, it improves your mood. It's actually a, a lot of bodily systems and mental systems are, are uh, essentially needing that sort of stress uh, if you, if you don't, uh, stress the system to some regard in the way that it was designed to be stressed, there will be subtle compromises. This is very much akin to, uh, osteoporosis, for example. Uh, when the astronauts go up in space, they're not stressing, uh, the skeleton. And so it starts to atrophy. And in the same way, same thing is happening, uh, to your body that your muscles will atrophy. Uh, down to, a, to the minimum level that they need to do what it is that they're doing, essentially, if it's to lie on the couch and then just get up to, to get to the refrigerator, that your, your musculature will become minimal uh, in order to simply deal with those demands and no others. And so, obviously, it, that's, there are limits to how much atrophy will go on. Uh, but the, the, the benefits of exercise are more comprehensive. And so if you were to look at uh, cellular markers of, of health, you will find that the very same markers that are improved by better diet are also improved by exercise. Uh, they, it all starts looking the same. In other words, there's a, there's a very multidimensional, complicated process involved in, in how uh, health processes work. And so uh, by not exercising, we're depriving ourselves of that. Uh, as it turned out, Chef AJ, who was never an exercise fan, started to do this. Uh, I didn't say make a big deal out of it, but do something. So whatever, whatever the plan was, 15 minutes a day of walking around the block wasn't any big deal. And she got so she really liked it. And it sort of changed her whole attitude about it. And I can't remember how long it took, but I think it was within months she felt like she wouldn't want to do without it, which is uh, exactly consistent with how, what most people's experience will be. Dr. Lyle, someone was saying uh, uh, how long it takes to, to uh, deplete the glycogen storages. I, I think I heard once Dr. McDougall saying that it may take two or three days. Is that right? Or is it pretty much you can burn it all in one day? Well, it depends on it depends how on low you are. <laughs> So, yeah, it depends on too many factors that are uh, individual. So it depends on how much uh, how much starch you've loaded up on in 24 hours as you go into the situation. Uh, it depends upon what it is that you're doing during the time when you uh, knock out all uh, possible uh, glycogen in uh, inputs to your diet. So typically, we will see people start to move into ketosis after about 24 hours of fasting. That would be normal. Uh, the fact that people could still have a little bit of glycogen hanging around longer than that would be no surprise, and that would just be part of, part of a normal uh, individual variation. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, Sue is asking, why do you think some people are so hostile to vegan diets? Well, people are hostile to things where they feel like they're threatened. Uh, so... In this case, vegan diets are threatening to the status of individuals who are not eating them because the, the uh, implication of a vegan diet is that we are doing something that is superior. So there's no question that there's a, that there's a latent uh, hierarchy that's involved here. 
So there's two, two directions that this hierarchy takes. One of them is that it's superior uh, physically, and the other one is that it's superior morally or ethically. And so essentially, it's going to be the case that, that uh, depending upon who the individual is on the other side of this, that they may feel uh, essentially criticized. And so that is, that is why it is that they're going to be hostile. So they will very often then attack a vegan diet, possibly on its merits physically, if they uh, believe that, that uh, they are being essentially criticized um, by, by not being that smart and knowing the uh, enough data points, et cetera. So they're going to fight about that. Or it could be that they are going to fight the grounds on moral ethical grounds, um, essentially that, that the vegan position is a hippy dippy, you know, uh, overly anthropomorphic, uh, silly, et cetera, and uh, not not manly, tough, or or uh, asserting human dominance and rights over the animal kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever it is that's going on, there's a sense of of that they are being criticized, and that's why actually my lecture on getting along without going along is all about trying to sand the edges off of the implied criticism uh, that comes when we are doing things in a way that require more self-discipline and intelligence than the people around us. Uh, we want to be very smooth about this because my, my goal is to actually execute this behavior myself uh, and, and minimize all social pressure around it. Uh, my goal is to not transport this information in new, new people's heads. So I'm not trying to uh, proselytize this in any way in my own private life. Um, the fact, the fact that I'm, that I do speaking and educating on this topic to people who are coming to us for the information and are asking us is an entirely different question. Uh, so the, the, the roles there are now clearly defined that I'm an educator and someone is seeking information. At that point, I'll talk all day about these issues. Uh, but when it comes to people that are not asking, then I'm not trying to do anything to make them uncomfortable. In fact, I'm going to try to go out of my way to see to it that they're as comfortable as possible. Right, right. I, I totally agree. I, I've, you know, at the beginning when you switch to eating right and, and losing weight, you're so excited to talk to everyone. You want to save the world. And sure. then you realize that, not everybody's interested in being saved. So it's a, it's a learning curve. Sure. I see AJ here saying that she walks mainly 90 minutes a day. Then I, she takes a spin class for 75 minutes three times a week. Yeah. Uh, and then do two or three yin yoga classes for 90 minutes. Um, so anyway. This, that's... I want to point out <laughs> that that is a revolution compared to what was going on five years ago. And Come. not only was it a revolution, there was considerable resistance to the whole idea. <laughs> and so clearly what we're watching is someone who discovered how good it felt uh, to, to exercise and be in really good condition. And, and then AJ being AJ, you know, <laughs> there's, there's no middle ground. <laughs> no. I just exercise no four times ground. as much as I am. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, AJ. I appreciate you being here and, and being such a powerful example to all of us. And uh, Dr. Lyle, tell us a little bit about salt. Salt is, a, is an interesting one, and it's one that I'm not that knowledgeable of, but I'll tell you a few, a few things that, I, that, that are being debated. Uh, this is one of those debates where uh, Alan Goldham and Dr. McDougall are going to snarl at each other a little bit. Obviously, they they agree on almost everything, but this is one of these little points of contention. And so, whenever uh, <laughs> I hate to put Jeff Novick in the middle of this uh, because uh, I, I'm not going to put him in the middle. So nobody call up Jeff and ask him what he thinks. So he he wants to. He's really good friends with both of these guys, as am I. The uh, I understand their perspectives, I believe. And that is that uh, Alan would say, listen, there's no sodium in nature where people were pouring it on their food. Uh, they would get their food, they would get their sodium from uh, natural situations. 
they would get it in low amounts. It would probably be about 500 milligrams a day, et cetera. And that's what we should be doing. So that's what the food at Turnarf is like. And it's bland, folks. <laughs> I can testify to that. Yeah, yes, you can testify. Okay, now, yes, yes. the Matugo program, um, I'm not sure how this is, but it, it seems like the food has more salt in it. I think it does. The um, It's still very low sodium. And so in both cases, both a McDougal diet, which which has some sodium in it or allows some sodium, uh, Jeff, a long time ago, uh, said that th the right eyeball estimate would be that there are, when you're looking at processed foods, one milligram per calorie. So in that way that a person shouldn't be eating probably more than a thousand milligrams a day of sodium, because they would get a little bit from their natural food. And then if they got one calorie per Per, or one milligram per calorie for many processed foods that they're eating, they would probably be on a diet of less than 2,000 milligrams a day, which is outstanding. Uh, typical American, I think, eats about 5,000 milligrams a day of sodium. Now, so what's the real issue? Dr. McDougall's attitude is, let's get the big picture right. Uh, we're, we're, trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to paint a really good picture, not necessarily a masterpiece. So we want to do a very good job. You want to get an A in your health and a McDougal diet will take you to an A. Now, let's suppose that we're someone, for example, who, it, whose blood pressure is not coming down that well on, on a McDougal diet. So it, a McDougal diet has been shown to be outstanding uh, with respect to helping high blood pressure. But let's suppose that yours is a little sticky then I would say, well, maybe you should go towards the True North diet, which is just a you know a little bit more strict. And uh, when people do that, typically they will get a little bit more benefit. So that's that's one way to look at it. And Alan also likes to point out, um, so I'm just gonna, it's a good question, so I'm gonna give you what I know. Alan likes to point out that when people eat higher sodium diets, uh, it turns out they're more likely to wake up, uh, possibly because they're thirsty so it's a, a little bit of a sleep disruptor. And so you're, you're more likely to sleep through the night uh, more soundly with a lower sodium diet. So he's all proud of this. And uh, this might be useful for people who are a little touchy in their sleep and maybe a little bit insomniac. So they might sleep for four hours and then pop awake and then have a hard time getting back to sleep. This may be a place where you wanna give a little bit of attention to. And, and see whether or not a completely whole natural foods diet, uh, i.e. a diet of extremely low sodium might be a benefit. So these are just a, a few little details. This is a, mm, there was a, a fine lecturer in, in California in the 1970s and 80s and 90s by the name of Jim Rohn. And uh, he's now passed away. He was a terrific motivational speaker. And he used to say the following, so don't major in minor things. And, uh, and so this is one of these questions that it's, a, it's an interesting little question. It's potentially important for a few select individuals, but this is a minor issue. Uh, the, big, the big picture, uh, as Jeff says, get the big things right first, then we'll worry about the little things. That's, that's true. You know, uh, I don't think they put any salt at the McDougall program, but they do have salt available. Got it. That's what it is. You okay. know, and he says, just put it on the surface and you only yes. need very little. Yes. It's, it's uh, like... and McDougall food, I have to say, tastes great. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, there's, there's some things about it that are, that are, uh, there's just some genius there in the kitchen and I can't reproduce it at home myself. But I don't have the patience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very, very good. good. Very good. I, Okay, there, here's another very interesting question. Whenever I try to give up the things that are keeping me fat uh, and sick, like chocolate, peanut butter, alcohol, and rich sugary desserts, I start to have cravings for these things and seem to have them even more. If I'm honest with myself, I realize that I want them all the time, whether I'm abstaining from them or not. But when I try and I go without them, I feel a profound sense of deprivation. Yes. I know I am not the kind of person who can have just a little of these things. So I am wondering if the cravings 
and deprivation that I feel are psychological, physiological, or both? Um, they're both. So the a, a craving is a psychophysiological event. Uh, so this is all tied in together. It's not one or the other. Uh, just like the craving for heroin is also a psychophysiological event. So or alcohol or anything else. So the, your this person is beautifully describing uh, uh, essentially an addictive process. And it's not an addictive process that's going to wind you up on the street with a bunch of uh, pencils and a cup and hoping to find a place to stay for the night. It's not that kind of an addiction. It's the kind of an addiction that is gentle, but it's profound. So this, this individual is in what I call the pleasure trap. And the pleasure trap is a, is a quietly devastating trap. It's, a, uh, it's, it's not yanking you into hell. That's not what it does. It doesn't, uh, this is not methamphetamine. Uh, this is not morphine. This is not cocaine. Uh, that's not how it works, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't destroy a life wholesale uh, and uh, basically put you in a in a psychological jail. Uh, that's not what it is. It's just a tug on your sleeve that keeps you off course. And so this this person uh, the the cravings that she's experiencing and the frustration uh, that she's experiencing. This is absolutely uh, what this process is, is this is an addiction. And this addiction it can easily and will be broken uh, with a period of abstinence. Probably, my guess is six weeks, and this entire thing looks completely different. So uh, as I've talked about at other times, what's going on is every time you, you um, have some of this stuff, what happens is, is that the memories now are very, very vivid. And so the next day, you're, you can remember extremely well what this tasted like, what the experience was. And so therefore the images, the mental images that you have as a result of the very recent experience now are chaining you to do it again the next day. So this is, uh, this is how this works. So just as if, if you had seen um, Gone with the Wind, yesterday, then today you would be flooded with memories of Gone with the Wind, and it would be very emotionally potent to you. But if you saw Gone with the Wind six weeks ago for the first time, it would still be interesting and you would still have feelings about it, but it would be fading away to the periphery and it wouldn't be nearly as potent. And so this is exactly how it works with, with rich food or with drugs for that matter, that the longer you go uh, before you dose yourself, the, the more and more the memories fade and the less potency they have. Now, that doesn't mean that if you go two months that you are out of the woods because uh, what will happen is you have a little adventurous curiosity seeking chip inside your head that will want you to circle back around and to check to make sure that you aren't being a fool and leaving something really fantastic on the table. And so very often people will then circle back around and check and then they get back on the trap again. So this is, um, there's no secret to staying out. The, the bottom line is, is that it's, it's tricky to stay out and it's hard to stay out permanently. Uh, but getting back out of the trap is important. It's useful to know that if you, if you dose yourself uh, with your drug of choice here and you've, you are in trouble um, you, because you now you have these hot memories that you're probably about three days away from from being in pretty good shape. So the um, that that's about what it takes for a little relapse to be put under control. The but this is why it is that we we do some very simple rules like we don't bring any junk food into the house so that it's not easy and it's not accessible. So we're not getting essentially reminded uh, on a daily basis or, or several times a week about what this tastes like and what it feels like. So yes, this is a great question. It's a great uh, personal description. And the answer is you have to be determined to get your environment clean enough and get clean. Uh, you don't have to go through the kind of withdrawals that people that fight drug addiction have to go through, but you've got to go through something similar. 
have got to go through something that is 15% of what it is that they go through. And you will see in that 15% that this is no joke. Uh, th these things do uh, grab us, grab that nervous system. And uh, they are, uh, you know, this, this process is not easy to, to get free of it. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. Um, I, I always wonder, uh, well, not always, but often wonder why, like, I know a couple of people uh, um, that can have one piece of whatever uh, it is, uh, I don't know, a piece of chocolate or a piece of cake or something, sure. and, and it can be little, and, and that's fine, and they don't want any more. Yes. Uh, and then, and does it not me, of course, no. and... Uh, is that something that is innate? Why is, uh, or is there even an explanation? <laughs> oh, I believe that that's innate. I don't think that there's any question about that. So there's uh, there's tremendous evidence about the individual differences in in reactivity to different chemicals. Uh, whether that those chemicals are artificial drugs or whether or not it's food, there's huge differences, and there's huge differences in sort of how how hot that motivation. Uh, gets lit with respect to all kinds of different stimuli. And so, yes, uh, that's just an indiv natural individual difference between people. And so that's that's the people that are there uh, cannot imagine what it's like to be an out of control racehorse uh, going through a box of seized candy. It's just not in them. So they'll, they will never understand us, uh, but us, we do understand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, here's another interesting question, um, one that I don't hear often and I, I, I would like to, to be asking, but it says, what is the best way to gain weight? Yes, the best way to gain weight is exactly the best, the opposite of the best way to lose it. So uh, the best, the best way, well, actually not quite, because when we, usually when people are losing weight, we are, we're trying to get them out, out of oil. And we're trying to get them out of uh, white bread and animal food. I see very about a, outside of all the high fat, high processed food. The best way to gain weight is actually to um, have processed healthy food in the diet. And so processed healthy food, an example of that would be whole grain pasta. So that, that would be an example of that. Uh, other things would be nuts and seeds. That would be another thing. Um, a very good, healthy bread, Ezekiel bread, for example. Uh, these are ways that, that people, ways that we process foods uh, in order to increase the overall calorie density. And that will that'll have people have their weight creep up uh, if they're very thin. Incidentally, not necessarily that easily uh, because of the individual differences. Uh, sometimes people are naturally very thin. And it, it, it's not that easy for them to gain very much weight. So if you have somebody that's 100 pounds and they're eating a very clean diet, if they eat a diet that's a, a lot richer, you might see them slowly gain five pounds and that may be all that happens. And so uh, sometimes, so the, the genes are having an enormous influence on the, 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 what we call the reaction range of what can happen to a person's uh, weight. Right, right. I see a lot of, um, I see some people that have questions that may be a little more specific, and I do want to take time to remind everybody, Dr. Lyle it's, um, can actually coach or help you online um, or by a phone call, if I'm, if I'm right. Is that correct? Yes, they sure. can contact you at Dr. Doug Lyle at yahoo.com. Is mm -hmm. that it? Sure. Yeah. Or go to your website at uh, Esteem Dynamics. Yes, I highly recommend everybody. I highly recommend half an hour with Dr. Lyle. Um, it's it's an invaluable. Uh, we have a question here about night eating, which is something that I sometimes, uh, if I if I have cravings, because like you said earlier, maybe one day I, I just didn't eat enough starches. If I have cravings, it's for some reason it's always at night. Yes. So, uh, but I always I'm sure to keep. Uh, sweet, very sweet, sweet potatoes or something that I can actually eat that is 
healthy. Any advice on how to curtail nighttime eating? I eat enough during the day, including mm -hmm. enough starch, but I just can't stop eating from the time I finish dinner until I go to bed. It's healthy food like fruit, veggies, and starch, but way more than I need, and, uh, and it makes me feel uncomfortable, not to mention I can't lose weight. Yes, I would say this. Uh, there's more than one thing to say about this, and that is that uh, if you eat a bunch at night, you're just going to eat less the next morning, so it's going to all come out on the wash. The, however, the, um, it's also characteristic of our species to actually be night eaters, interestingly enough. So uh, when, when we have studied hunter-gatherer tribes around the world, there's about 175 of them, uh, we find that they have the a, almost identical rhythm, no matter where it is that they're on the planet. And that is that they're, they're essentially eating raw foods during the day that they can that they could pick and eat and then at nighttime they're bringing the uh if men have have uh hunted successfully and there's meat and the women have been digging for tubers or you know root vegetables or other other uh, starchy uh, products they're bringing all those together at the end of the day and they're cooking and so the vast majority of calories uh, for human beings are eaten in the evening um so i i don't know if we have downright evolutionary biology for this, but we certainly have a rhythmic pattern of how human beings go about their business that is consistent with this. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I'm, I'm the same way. I will eat most of my calories, you know, from 5 p.m. on. Now, so I understand what this person is saying. It just seems like a good idea to keep eating. The uh, I've also become aware that you can change this and you can change this by having a hard stop. So you may have a hard stop at say eight o'clock and that's it. And you just don't eat anymore at all after eight o'clock. Now here's the trick with this. And that is that you are conditioned right now to continue to eat. So that means that you actually have all kinds of mental physiological machinery that is anticipating that you're going to eat. And so even when you're not hungry, you can have essentially cravings cooking up inside the nervous system as you're anticipating that you are, in fact, going to be eating at 930 or 10 o'clock or whatever it is. So those are slightly uncomfortable and disturbing, and they become part of a motivational uh, system. And so that can be dialed down. That can be eliminated. Uh, but just this is very much akin to the addiction process that I was just talking about. And so uh, it probably has a similar time frame, probably maybe less because we're not dealing with supernormal stimuli. But uh, my guess is, is that in about uh, pro probably three weeks, you can counter condition your nervous system that right now believes that it's going to be getting food and therefore actually kicks up some digestive processes uh, outside of your awareness, uh, even after dinner. So you can you can essentially counter condition this by not uh, by by making a hard stop and you should be out of the woods uh, probably in less than a month. So that's how you can do that. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, there was someone earlier here on the chat. I think this person might be here still. I'm not sure. But was asking uh, that. Um, I can't remember now if it was a man or a woman. I think it was a lady and saying that she had, had uh, been diagnosed with cancer and had um, surgery but doesn't need any other treatment. And she was wondering if you could say something about um, the starch solution, if there are certain foods that she should eat more of or less of in this case. Not that I know of. Uh, my my uh, my strategy would be to eat an extremely healthy diet that would be uh, essentially the, the the diet that would be recommended by John McDougal would be the diet that I would be recommending. In other words, uh, different fruits and vegetables. Uh, we, we I don't think the notion that there are particular foods that are higher in cancer fighting phytochemicals is likely to be true. Um, I know that there's people that speculate on that, but here's the problem. 
and that is that uh, the phytochemicals are not well identified. And so the, the fact that they found a lot of them in leafy greens doesn't mean that they're not going to find a whole heck of a lot of them in sweet potatoes that we haven't seen yet. And so uh, my, my thinking is, is that I don't think that that is going to be a substantive issue with respect to cancer uh, retardation. I think that, that uh, the most important thing is what, what you are not eating. We want to make sure that we're not eating animal food. We're not eating heated oils, uh, et cetera. And we want to take every opportunity to, so rather than eating bread, we would rather be eating a, a steamed potato, in other words, for those starches. So we want to be eating things as, uh, as natural as possible so that we're getting the chemistry that our natural history uh, was, was de designed on. And if we do that, I believe that you're going to give yourself an optimal defense against cancer from the dietary point of view. Uh, Dr. Lyle, do you, uh, I think I've heard Dr. McDougall talk about how nuts come in a shell for a reason. <laughs> Nowadays, we can go to the store and buy a can and open it and just eat the whole thing. Right. And in the older times, you have to, you know, crack each one and it take you two hours maybe to have a, a little bag. Sure. Uh, and now people are asking if it's okay, like someone here is asking to eat chestnuts every day or, or va vacuum packed, whole peel cooked chestnuts, useful for snacking. And uh, what what are your thoughts? I mean, it's not unhealthy, I don't think, but would it, would it prevent weight loss? Oh, I think it would. And so uh, I think the studies that have shown that it's not related to weight loss were done way too, way too uh, small of an end and for not long enough period of time. If, if I remember, uh, I think Jeff Novick has, has covered this in, in fairly uh, comprehensive detail. Yeah, nuts are a high fat food. And so uh, they're not a food that our ancestors would have had uh, 365 day a year access to particularly not in large amounts. Uh, are they healthy biochemically? Sure they are. Uh, is it something that, that um, I, it's one of the first places I would look in a really healthy diet. If a person is 10 or 15 or 20% overweight, but they're eating a fair amount of nuts, uh, that, that would be a place where I would be looking to cut it down. So yeah, they're, they're certainly suspicious in the fact that they're 2,500 calories a pound and they are the richest foods in nature, period. Uh, there is no other natural food that, that matches nuts and seeds. They're basically the same. And so, uh, yes, that, that they are should be used in moderation. Right, right. What are your thoughts? I don't think I've ever asked you this about uh, the uh, environment. Do you uh, follow a plant-based diet uh, now more because of... Uh, you know, the dangers of the environment or uh, is that something that doesn't bother you? <laughs> uh, people differ a lot on this and people, uh, there's tremendous diversity of scientific opinion about it, all kinds of things with respect to our environment. And I'm not expert enough to, uh, to be commenting uh, about this and I don't know that much about it. I, m my, uh, my way of thinking about this is that by uh, having a vegan uh, lifestyle, uh, I'm certainly doing more than my part relative to uh, the the average American uh, with respect to the environment. But I uh, I have a lot of trust that the environmental issues will probably be fine. Uh, there's going to be some continued impact of human activity on Earth, and there has been for thousands of years. And uh, I think that there's going to have to be you know, cautious uh, government and international concern about these things and you know, as the future unfolds. But I'm not personally panicked about anything. Uh, I'm just going to do my job, uh, eat healthfully, uh, be responsible, and call it good. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's just uh, touch one more topic, and then we can uh, uh, finish the webinar. And I want to thank you, everybody, again, for logging in today. And um, just about... Uh, uh, vegetable fat, of course, uh, Dr. McDougall or you or True North or many of the other doctors don't recommend any uh, process, any like oil or, or vegetable oil. But when we're talking about uh, f 
the vegetable fat that comes from the vegetables that we're eating. Is there somebody saying, um, how much vegetable fat can one eat on the McDougal diet? Is there any kind of limit? Oh, well, I don't think so. Um, I, it would be a, an absurd looking diet to overload it with fat. You'd have to eat a bunch of nuts and avocado and you'd be that you'd be getting uh, the majority of your calories from there. And then if you did that, I don't think that that would be a very healthy diet. I think it, I think if you start eating a diet that's 50% fat, I think there's going to be problems. Um, do I think that the system would tolerate it? Yeah, I think it would tolerate it fairly well. It, it tolerates a, a super high fat diet in a conventional American. So uh, you, you, could eat, you could eat very high quantities of vegetable, uh, natural vegetable fat, and you would survive and you would be okay. Uh, would you be in as good a condition if you're eating a diet that is more consistent uh, with the kind of balances that we look for, no, I don't think that you would be in as good a shape. So, um, yeah, I don't worry about fat contents. I'm not trying to measure it and keep it at 10% or 15% or whatever it is that anybody thinks. Uh, my job right. is to eat the majority of my calories are coming from the big starches. Uh, I'm surrounding those with fruits and vegetables, and uh, and I and I don't worry about about uh, fat content. Don't worry about the content of anything, quite frankly. I just right. eat the food. It just comes in the right uh, proportions in the package. It was intended. Out. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, one more thing. Someone is saying that her husband has high blood pressure, even though he has been on a plant-based diet for two years. Uh, yes. Now, it's, it's hard to to know unless, of course, we knew exactly what that person eats on a daily right. basis. Do you have any ideas of why or what foods this person who is on a plant-based diet might be eating that keeps the blood pressure high? I, I would tell them to be eat, to eat a pure diet. In other words, nothing other than than essentially cooked tubers, uh, you know, rice, beans, potatoes, steamed vegetables, and fruit, and call it a day. And no sauces, nothing out of a can, no processed anything, no bread, no earth balance spread, no peanut butter, nothing. In other words, let's just see what happens. And so we, we, we do that for 30 days, i.e. a diet really close to our natural history that probably has three to 500 milligrams of sodium a day. And we see what 30 days of that does, okay? If 30 days of that does not bring the blood pressure substantially down, then I would write to me and I will tell you what you do from there. The, uh, but, but first we do that because that is... Uh, the, the first suggestion, not the only, but the first, the number one likelihood is that the kidneys are not keeping up with the sodium demand. And even though the person could be on a very healthy diet, they could have sufficiently reduced kidney function uh, that they just can't handle uh, even 2,000 milligrams a day. So they, they may have to head for 500. And at that point, if, if that helps, the whole body gets caught up. Uh, they diurese down. They lose a few pounds of water takes a tremendous amount of pressure off the cardiopulmonary system, and uh, we wind up with much lower blood pressure. So uh, if that, it's not the only cause, it's just the most likely one. And so if that doesn't work, write to me, uh, at Dr. Doug Lyle at yahoo.com, and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll send you information to go from there. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. Really, uh, really appreciate it. I know everybody here is uh, super appreciative and excited for your time and um i just before we leave uh if you have to leave please, please feel free i just want to take a minute and show um the healthy taste of uh sacramento so the people that maybe um wanting to attend the taste events and it's called healthy taste online.com and even though the event is sold out um, I think, yeah, I saw that. You can still get the online version available, and so you can watch it from the comfort of your own home. And um, I know you, like I said earlier, I know you will be there, and I will be there as well. Okay, here we are. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Lyle. Yes. <laughs> and uh, next week, I will be back with Dr. McDougall talking um, 
uh, about diabetes. This is uh, going to be a very, very good webinar. I suggest everybody goes to his website and, and read the newsletter that he wrote about diabetes. I think it's one of the most brilliant articles that he has uh, written, and it needs to be read uh, by everyone. And uh, next week, he's going to be talking about that and hopefully taking questions. So I will see you in a, uh, in a couple of days, Dr. Lyle, in Santa Rosa. And maybe I'll see some of you that are planning to attend the Advanced Study Weekend. All right. Well, thank you and goodbye. Very good. Bye. Bye-bye.